Germany, November 2013. The world is stunned as more than 1,500 lost artworks seized by the Nazis are found safe in a small rundown apartment in Munich. Valued at over a billion and including works by Matisse, Picasso and Chagall, it had been assumed they were all destroyed in the carnage of the Second World War, a conflict that threatened to obliterate many of mankind's greatest artistic achievements. The remarkable discovery of these lost paintings is the latest chapter in the story of the Monuments Men, a group of art experts who, in the last years of the war, set out to solve the greatest art theft in history. Now, a major Hollywood film directed and produced by George Clooney and featuring an all-star cast is telling their extraordinary story. As the Allies fight to liberate Europe, the Monuments Men battle to save its soul. Omaha Beach, July 1944. It's a month since the first shot of D-Day. And while the Allied battlefront pushes inland towards the German borders, behind the front line is former art conservator at the Fogg Museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts, now Lieutenant George Leslie Stout. George Stout was very keen on the idea of doing everything he could to, to make sure that there was something left when this war was over. The 47-year-old has been handed a unique opportunity. He's an officer in a newly formed unit with very special orders. The Monuments, Fine Arts and Archive section, or as it was referred to oftentimes, MFA and A, was a group of museum directors, curators, art historians, artists themselves who volunteered for service during World War II to be a new kind of soldier, one charged with saving rather than destroying. These are people who are curators of museums and you know, art historians, people who are well past their prime, not exactly the people you would pick for soldiering. The common bond is their expertise or their, their love of, of art in all its forms. And their understanding of the need of spiritual nourishment that comes through art. Stout and other Monuments men are charged with the responsibility of saving Europe's culture. A mission enshrined in an historic order from Allied Supreme Commander General Eisenhower. Shortly, we will be fighting our way across the continent of Europe in battle designed to preserve our civilization. Inevitably, in the path of our advance, will be found historical monuments and cultural centers which symbolize to the world all that we are fighting to preserve. It is the responsibility of every commander to protect and respect these symbols whenever possible. General Eisenhower's order says quite clearly that cultural treasures, national icons, the treasures of, of Western civilization, that they must be protected and preserved, if at all possible. So this isn't merely a war for the winning of battles. This is a war for the very survival of humanity. The size of the task facing Stout and his monuments men is unprecedented. For the last five years, Hitler has been waging war not just on the people of Europe, but on their art and cultural heritage too. In Hitler's quest to build a thousand-year Reich, it was important to eliminate completely the cultures of inferior lesser races. It isn't just a question of defeating and occupying but it's a war of annihilation, a war of elimination. Art, national treasures, culture, heritage, all prey victim to support the much larger objective of Hitler's view of the world. Treasures would be taken, monuments would be dismantled, whole cities would be destroyed. Hitler's assault on Europe's cultural treasures begins 
as soon as he rises to power in the 1930s. He uses art as a political tool to promote and protect Nazi ideals. Part of Hitler's vision for the Thousand Year Reich was that Germany would dominate the world culturally. And one way they were going to do this was through the construction of a vast cultural complex in Hitler's hometown of Linz, Austria. Hitler's vision, reproduced in a scale model, will turn the industrial Danube riverfront into a purpose-built city dedicated to the glory of Aryan supremacy. At its heart would be an enormous museum that would house every important work of art in the world. Hitler's Führer Museum is to showcase the very best of Germanic art and celebrate the Aryan ideals of the Nazis. Its 30 miles of galleries will house all of Europe's greatest masterpieces, works by artists approved of by the Nazis. But Hitler condemns modernist, abstract and cubist art as degenerate, along with all works by Jewish and Slavic artists. He orders them to be sold or destroyed. They burnt Picassos, they burnt Salvador Dali's, they burnt Klee's. In the, in the yard, they just pulled them out and burned them. By publicly burning works of art, you can see a very disturbing parallel with the way they approached people. The Nazis were burning paintings in the same way that they would later be burning bodies of people they wanted to eliminate from society. With the success of D-Day, the war enters its final year, and the preservation of art becomes one of the focal points of the Allied plans to defeat Hitler. Art is the soul of a society. Uh, it represents the very best things that we have achieved, and um, to go after that art and try to rescue it and try to save it and protect it and preserve it is, is this incredibly noble endeavor. And one being made against all the odds. As a million Allied soldiers risk their lives to liberate Europe, the Allies fight through territories containing some of the most treasured cultural symbols in the world. Those treasures are now the responsibility of the Monuments Men. One of the great misunderstandings about the Monuments Men is that there was a unit or a section, that there was this team of soldiers uh, moving about. In fact, there were just a handful of them. Joining George Stout on the front line of the Western Allies in 1944 are four other middle-aged art experts. James Rorimer, a museum curator from Cleveland, Ohio, is attached to the communication zone. Walker Hancock, a sculptor from St. Louis, Missouri, accompanies the U.S. first. Architect Robert Posey joins Patton's U.S. third. And British scholar Ronald Balfour is assigned to the Canadian first. Coordinating these men spread out across Europe is de facto leader George Stout. Stout's very conservative. He's extremely methodical. He's an unexcitable character, very steady, and this proves to be of great importance to the Monuments officers as they get in the field and find themselves in combat. Almost immediately, the Monuments men's mission on the ground is challenged. They believe in their mission. They believe it's a great idea, but there's a great deal of skepticism that Army commanders are ever going to listen to a bunch of art historians, artists, professors in uniform telling them what to do. Colonel, if you would just read the orders. I'll tell you what these orders say. Don't knock out Colonel, the building. Do not interrupt me, Lieutenant. Superior officers, half their age, are in a position of trying to understand why in the world is this elderly guy in front of me telling me I can't aim at this church or aim at some structure when I know that there's German snipers or the enemy inside of it. At the historic city of Saint-Lô, Normandy, the Monuments men witness firsthand the shocking destruction of war. To force a breakthrough, the Allies reduce the city to rubble. To try to preserve or protect a building, a piece of art, 
when the stakes are so high, it highlights all the more the challenge that the monuments men faced. It's a conundrum. I mean, it, it seems an almost unworkable problem that they're going in to save important historic items, the, these treasures of Europe, at the same time, were destroying the very city in which they're placed. Few records of those who witnessed the destruction of saint lô survive today. But amongst them are the papers of Monuments Man James Rorimer. There was havoc and destruction everywhere. The recording of damage amid the many gaping craters and fire-swept buildings was a thankless task. At times, it was like scooping up wine from the streets after the keg had burst. If war is reducing whole cities to rubble, what hope do the monuments men have of saving Europe's fragile masterpieces? September 1944. As the monuments men spread out across Europe, they realized that their mission to protect historic buildings and art treasures is close to impossible. 300 miles northeast of Saint-Lô, the Normandy town destroyed in fighting, 40-year-old British scholar Major Ronald Balfour, the monuments man with the Canadian First Army, arrives in the Belgian city of Bruges. Here he discovers that the Nazis have been systematically stealing art as well as destroying it. It was certainly the biggest art heist ever. There's no question about it. There's never been anything like it. You know, millions and millions of pieces of art. To realize Hitler's vision of a super museum in Linz, the Nazis seize Europe's finest masterpieces. The artwork is stolen to order. For the Nazis, the plunder was actually a way for them to reacquire works that they believed had been wrongly taken from Germany. Hitler had curators that compiled for him a catalog of works of art that had been created by German artists or artisans or had been taken from Germany. Hitler would flip through these catalogs like mail order catalogs, selecting works of art. Top of Hitler's wish list are two priceless works of art in Belgium, the area assigned to Monuments Man Balfour. The first is the Ghent Altar, a 15th century Renaissance masterpiece by the brothers Van Eyck. The Ghent Altarpiece is one of the premier pieces of art ever stolen. And it was Hitler's intent to have it. You know, he wanted that piece. And the second is the Madonna and Child, a marble sculpture by Michelangelo. Hitler could hardly not want a magnificent sculpture by Michelangelo, the Bruges Madonna. The Ginn altarpiece, perhaps the most famous altarpiece in the world, was not going to escape attention either. Hitler argues that the Ghent altarpiece is rightfully his. Panels from the masterpiece had originally belonged to Germany, but under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was forced to hand them to Belgium as reparations for the First World War. So this is a work that's targeted by Hitler uh, almost from the get-go. It's perceived to be Germanic in origin. All works that are considered Germanic are subject to be not stolen, but in Hitler's view, repatriated back to Germany. In 1940, the Belgians tried to ship the altarpiece to safety, but it was eventually seized by the Nazis. So by recapturing it, Hitler felt that he was reversing a perceived wrong on the part of the German people inflicted by the Treaty of Versailles. As the scale of Nazi art theft becomes clear, the monument's men's mission takes on a new, urgent dimension. The Nazis are on the run, but they're taking everything with them. So we have to get as close to the front as we can. Now it's not just a matter of trying to mitigate allied damage to structures or affect temporary repairs regardless of who caused the damage. I think they're realizing at that stage they're becoming de facto art detectives trying to uh, hunt down these works of art and what ends up becoming the greatest theft in history. August 1944 and the Americans reach Paris. The monument's man overseeing operations in the French capital 
is James Rorimer. Rorimer loves all things French. He speaks French fluently. Uh, part of his family owns um, an apartment in Paris. He's traveled extensively throughout France and knows the country very, very well. He's kind of a bulldog of a figure, very ambitious, extremely self-confident. On his way to the French capital, Rorimer wonders. What was the fate of the many historic buildings of the Venus de Milo, the Mona Lisa, and the myriad of art objects which had made Paris the most famous art center in the world. On the surface, Rorimer's mission to safeguard France's cultural treasures seems relatively simple. Paris surrendered early on in the war. It was virtually unscathed from the lightning German victory in, in 1940. As a result, its many treasures, its many historic buildings, its wonderful museums, were largely untouched by the, the damage of the Second World War. But in August, after the Monuments Man arrives in the city, James Rorimer discovers that France's artworks have not been so lucky. When Monuments Man James Rorimer arrives in Paris in August 1944, he discovers that France's national collection has been spirited away not by the Nazis, but by the French themselves. In 1939, fearing Nazi occupation, the director of the Louvre orders the evacuation of the famous gallery. Its masterpieces, including the Mona Lisa and the Venus de Milo, are all packed away and shipped to safety. They're stored in shadows across an unoccupied free zone under the control of a temporary Vichy French government working with the Nazis. It was a highly organized operation. One curator later remarked that if the French army had been as prepared as the Fine Arts Administration, they might have won the Battle of 1940. Paris's national collections are safe, but the belongings of its wealthy citizens have been seized by the Nazis. What is all this? People's lives. What people? Jews. In June 1940, Hitler orders the seizure of all cultural artifacts belonging to Jews and other enemies of the Third Reich. A special task force known as the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, or ERR, ransack all of the Jewish-owned art collections in Paris. The Nazi plunder of French Jewish collections is mind-boggling. They plundered the most famous collections in France, from the Rothschild family, the Kahn, Seligman, Bernheim. These were the most famous collectors in France and some of the most famous collectors in the world. So many works are stolen that the Nazis set up a processing station near the Louvre at the Jeux de Paume Museum. Here, tens of thousands of France's most valued artworks are catalogued, photographed and sorted. But before the art is shipped to Germany, the Nazi elite are invited to pilfer at their leisure. Chief among them, Hermann Goering. Goering basically used the Jeux de Pomme as a shopping mall. And so they set it up like an exhibition space with all of the work that was pilfered. Goering visited the Jeux de Pomme 20 times. The ERR officials working in the museum would prepare this museum for him. They would lay out the plundered tapestries for him. They would have champagne waiting. Uh, it was a very elegant affair in which Goering would walk around this small museum and hand pick works for his own collection. Champagne. Sehr schön. Wollen Sie sich ein Glas? Sehr gern. We need another champagne glass. Oui, monsieur. Watching everything that happens inside the Jeux de Pomme is Rose Vallon. A volunteer at the museum before the war, she stays on to secretly gather information on the looting operation 
for the French resistance. Rose Vallon, in the middle of all this activity, is making lists of the works that are coming in. They thought she was simply monitoring things around the museum like heat and electricity and making their jobs easier. Actually, she was noting all of their activities and keeping track of where all that plundered art was going. In August 1944, as the Allied advance accelerates towards Paris, the Nazi art operation at the Jeux de Paume moves into overdrive. In the space of a few weeks, more than 20,000 pieces of art seized from Jews by the Nazis are shipped out of the museum and deep into Germany. Recovering France's looted collections now becomes the number one priority for monuments man James Rorimer. To succeed, he must first persuade Rose Vallon to give up her secrets. How can I help you steal our stolen art? That's not why I'm here. I'm here to help you get it back. Yes, to uh, fill your museum. And the French spy isn't going to make it easy. In October 1944, Monument's men attached to the Western Allies reach Germany's western border. The city of Aachen stands as the first major German city to be vulnerable to capture by the Allies. For the Monument's men, Aachen, the historic capital of Charlemagne, the German Emperor of the First Reich, is a city that must be protected. Hitler recognized the importance of this. This was a, a city rich in symbolism. This is why Hitler declares Aachen as a fortress city. It must be defended to the last man, the last woman, the last child. The battle for Aachen confirms the monument's men's worst fears. Protecting Europe's cultural heritage from the ravages of war is beyond them. During a month of fighting, much of the thousand-year-old city is destroyed. In the middle of all the destruction is 43-year-old Walker Hancock, attached with the U.S. First Army. Walker Hancock was dramatically affected by the destruction he sees in Aachen when he arrives. For two weeks, we had watched Aachen burning below the horizon, an unsteady glow in the sky at night. Behind these roofless brick fronts was only emptiness. The city was utterly abandoned. I realized at once what I later so often found to be true, that a skeleton city is more terrible than one that the bombs have completely flattened. Aachen was a skeleton. My father spent time as a young person in Germany. He was steeped in European culture. He was extremely open to doing anything he could to preserve whatever little piece of civilization he could. Amidst the ruins of Aachen, Walker Hancock discovers a clue to the whereabouts of the city's treasures. In the basement of a museum, he finds a catalogue. It lists all of the city's most important pieces of art, and alongside each of the entries, a place name. So many times when the Monuments men would get a clue, uh, that's all it was. It was a name, it was a place, but they'd be looking at each other wondering, you know, is that a name or is it a place? What is it that we've found? Walker Hancock has uncovered his first major lead. Aachen's looted treasures have been taken deep inside Nazi Germany to a place called Siegen. But getting there is going to be tough. In December 1944, the Allied advance into Germany and the progress of its monuments men is halted when Hitler launches a massive counterattack in the West. As Allied reinforcements flood to the Battle of the Bulge, new recruits join the ranks of the Monuments Men. I found myself 
on my 19th birthday on a truck to go up front to fight in the Battle of the Bulge. And I got pulled out. Harry Ettlinger, a German Jew, had fled Germany in 1938. Somebody came to me and he said, I understand you knew how to speak and write German. And yeah, that was my entry into the monuments. Another new recruit is Lincoln Kirstein, a man the army has difficulty accepting. Lincoln Kirstein was a Jewish, bisexual, New York intellectual who was very much out of his depths in Nazi vanquished Europe. The monuments officers that are already overseas are uh, clamoring to have Kirstein because Kirstein, in their view, is basically a human Google. He knows something about everything. George Stout recognizes talent when he sees it and pairs his newest recruit with an old hand. Looks like we're going to be together, buddy. Robert Posey was someone who was very likable. He was a member of the armed forces, unlike most of the Monuments men. I think they made a good pair because they played off of each other well. Kirstein would not have known what to do in the field, uh, surrounded by soldiers the way Posey did. But Posey, on the other hand, had an appreciation for the arts, but not a deep intellectual understanding of them. And they complemented each other to create the perfect combination. Posey and Kirstein, assigned to the U.S. Third Army, take up the challenge of tracking down the artwork from Belgium stolen by the Nazis. Top of their list is the famous Ghent altarpiece and Bruges Madonna. Lincoln Kirstein felt that the best way he could get revenge on the Nazis and on Hitler was by recapturing the single greatest object that the Nazis wanted in terms of stolen art, and that was the Ghent altarpiece. It became for him a symbol of all of the stolen art that they could try to save. If he could save this one work and bring it back to the Belgian people, then he would right the great wrong that Hitler did across Europe. Finding these priceless artworks is now their greatest challenge. In the last months of the war, the location of the hidden Nazi art depots containing Europe's treasures is still a mystery. In March 1945, Robert Posey, Lincoln Kirstein, and Ronald Balfour are the monument's men trying to track down two stolen masterpieces, the Ghent altarpiece and the Bruges Madonna. On the 10th, while evacuating a sculpture from a damaged church in Cleves, a mortar explodes in the street where Ronald Balfour is overseeing the operation. He's killed outright and becomes the first monuments man to die in action. The death of Ron Balfour has all sorts of reverberations for the monuments men. I think it reminded everybody of the mortality of what they were faced with, but it also gave poignant uh, attention to this question, is art worth a life? It's a very difficult question. Is art, is culture, is something material worth human life? In the individual case, I would almost say without hesitation, no. But when the struggle is, is for civilization itself, for the high-minded ideals, it is worth fighting for. In an extract taken from Ronald Balfour's own papers, he reveals the values for which he gives his life. Every civilization is formed not merely by its own achievements, but by what it has inherited from the past. If these things are destroyed, we have lost a part of our past, and we shall be the poorer for it. With news of Balfour's death, the monument's men redouble their efforts to preserve Europe's culture. You'll see to the this family gets these. We will. I believe the Monuments men really become personally involved in their respective hunts for particular works of art. Something as iconic as Michelangelo's Bruges Madonna. These are works of art that these Monuments officers knew about and they were determined to find them. 
In Paris, monuments man James Rorimer is endeavouring to recover the tens of thousands of artworks looted from France's wealthy Jews. Months into his investigations, Rose Vallon, the French spy working for the resistance inside the Jeu de Pomme, is yet to tell him everything she knows. She didn't trust anybody because she knows that the Americans are going to march into these areas and win, and she didn't want to help them find it because she thought they wouldn't give it back. But Vallon's fears are about to be overtaken by wider events. In March 1945, with the war clearly lost, Hitler issues his Nero Befehl, his Nero Decree. Hitler's Nero Decree specified that nothing of value would be left to fall into Allied hands. When the Allies were on German territory, anything and everything that could be of use to them or to the civilian population that remained behind would be destroyed. Hitler said, burn it. Hitler said, burn it all. If I'm dead, destroy it. The issuance of the Nero decree, in essence, creates a race against time. At this stage now, uh, Allied forces are on the move into Germany, trying to find where these works of art are. Uh, the great concern being that um, they may be destroyed. Look at the Nero decree. It is written by Hitler, signed by Hitler. It says if he dies or if Germany falls, they're to destroy everything. Everything. Where did they take the art? Germany. You understand I'm here to help you. I understand you are, but you are not in Germany. My men are. I don't know your men. Rose Vallon wanted to ensure that James Rorimer himself would be going to those repositories where the French art treasures were stored. She needed to know that he would be there uh, so that he could ensure personally that the art treasures of France would be saved. In March 1945, Rorimer is promoted. He'll join the US 7th Army deep inside Germany. On hearing the news, Vallon invites him to her apartment. So while Rorimer is at Vallon's apartment, she goes into her bedroom and comes back with a stack of papers and some photographs. She shows him the lists of works of art that she had been creating throughout the occupation. I have kept train manifests, uh, receipts, letters for every single piece. No who it belonged to, who took it, uh, where, where they took it. Oh. And she showed him pictures of the repositories where he would find the great treasures of France. There's a castle in the Bavarian Alps, Neuschwanstein. The fairy tale Neuschwanstein Castle in southwest Bavaria is today famous as the model for Disney's castle. But in 1944, it's the central repository for France's stolen art. But the fate of these works now hangs in the balance. The Soviet army is advancing on Berlin, deploying squads of soldiers to plunder what they can from Germany. Towards the end of the war, members of the Red Army's so-called trophy squads were looking to re-steal the stolen art and bring it back to Soviet Russia. So there was something of a race between the monuments men and the Russian trophy squads in trying to reach the art first, the monuments meant to return it to the victims, the Russians to steal it. With war's end in sight, monuments men scattered across Germany are the first to discover major caches of plundered art. April, May 1945 serve as hallmark months not just in the lives of the monuments officers, but to people all over the world today who go to museums and churches and enjoy the magnificence of mankind's greatest creative achievements. In April, Walker Hancock and George Stout reach a copper mine at Siegen, the location marked on the ledger Hancock discovered in Aachen five months earlier. What they find inside would shock even the most seasoned of art detectives. 
Ten months after the start of their mission, Monuments men Walker Hancock and George Stout make their first major discovery, a cache of looted art inside a German mine. These mines were huge chambers, 60 feet wide, 40 feet high, and a mile long, 700 feet below the surface, in which they kept the boxes for the museum, for the libraries, and the personal belongings. This discovery at Siegen is quickly followed by another. At Merkers, 125 miles to the east, Monuments men Robert Posey and Lincoln Kirstein discover a repository containing art from more than a dozen German state museums. Also inside is the contents of the Third Reich's treasury. Over 8,000 bars of gold bullion, thousands of bags of gold and silver coins, and crates of currency worth 37 billion dollars today. The discovery of stolen art and treasure at the Merkers mine was really eye-opening. It was the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the Nazis had stolen, but the scale of it was absolutely tremendous. By the start of May 1945, Hitler is dead. His suicide and the fall of Berlin means the war is over. But the monuments men have unfinished business. In the south, James Rorimer, attached to the US 7th Army, arrives at Neuschwanstein Castle. Inside, just as Rose Vallon had insisted he would, Rorimer discovers 20,000 pieces of art, furniture, and jewelry stolen from France's Jewish families. There was all kinds of art and furniture and high, high quality, things like that. Every room was filled with boxes and crates, some of which were never touched. Racks and platforms held boxes of paintings. Others were simply jammed onto shelves. Some rooms held nothing but gold. Throughout the spring of 1945, the monument's men recover major collections across Germany. Tens of thousands of masterpieces are saved, but countless others are still missing. The Bruges Madonna, along with the Ghent altarpiece, became the bifocal of the Allied investigation of looted art. These were the number one and number two objects that they sought to try to recapture, because they were the two most famous objects that the Nazis had stolen. Not for the first time in the work of the Monuments Men, luck plays a big part in the discovery of stolen treasures. The salvation of Europe's greatest artworks is all down really to a fortuitous toothache. Robert Posey has an impacted tooth, and to treat it, he visits a dentist in the German town of Trier. The dentist was chatting with Kirstein while he was working on Posey, and he asked, well, what do you do with the Allied army? And they said, well, we're trying to protect works of art. And he said, ah, you should meet my son-in-law. He's also an art historian. He lives a few miles from here. He may be able to help you. Huh? Is he a soldier? Uh, he was a soldier, <laughs> like you. Robert Posey and Lincoln Kirstein have by chance found themselves in the hideout of SS officer Hermann Bunyis. Helga, we have guests. The former art advisor to Hermann Goering. Here was this SS soldier. He was a trained killer, but he was in hiding, not from the Allies, but from the German people, because the SS were so feared by the Germans that he was in greater danger of their vigilante justice than he was of being arrested by the Allied soldiers. Hoping that the monument's men might offer him protection for information, Bunyas pours out all he knows about the Nazi art looting operation at the Jeu de Pomme in Paris. 
And the most important thing that he mentioned and pointed to on a map was a salt mine that had been converted to a secret stolen art depot in the mountains of Austria at a place called Altossi. On May the 12th, 1945, an American infantry unit approaches the site of the reported art depot at Altossi. Inside the mountain, Monuments men Kirstein and Posey discover crate after crate of stolen art. We came into a very large and high rock vaulted cavern. Here, lying on its side, cushioned on an old brown and white striped mattress and covered with pieces of asphalt paper, was the Michelangelo from Bruges. And in another chamber, finally, the Ghent altarpiece. It's 500-year-old panels propped up against the wall. Inside this one repository, the monument's men recover 6,755 paintings, 137 pieces of sculpture, historical artifacts, and much, much more. The monuments officers then are faced with a, an epic problem. What do you do when you find salt mines filled with sculpture by Michelangelo, paintings by Leonardo da Vinci and Jan van Eyck, Rembrandt and others, uh, by the thousands? With the war over, the monuments men lead a massive peacetime operation to repatriate Europe's rescued art. In central collection points, Recovered artworks from over a thousand Nazi repositories are catalogued. We had the concept and the ability and the workforce to give it back whenever possible. We believed in what we were doing, what the right thing to do. In total, nearly 350 monuments men and women from 13 nations worked tirelessly to return Europe's stolen art to its rightful owners. By 1951, when the last collecting point closed, this tiny organization had facilitated the return of five million objects, stolen and at risk of destruction by the Nazis. The victory of the Allies in World War II was a remarkable achievement of arms and of industry. But without the monuments men, without the deliberate preservation of these priceless treasures, these all-important symbols of the best of Western civilization, I think that victory would have been less than it actually was. They preserved the absolute best of what the West was fighting for. Of the handful of monuments men who began work in Europe in July 1944, two were killed in action. For his work as a monuments man, James Rorimer was awarded the Bronze Star and the French Legion of Honor. Rose Vallon also received the Legion of Honor. She is one of France's most decorated women. Despite the heroic efforts of the monuments men and women, not all of the works of art stolen by the Nazis were recovered. Today, the Art Loss Register, the central database of stolen art, believes that as many as 200,000 masterpieces remain missing and continues its search to recover them.